Praise the Lord. Um, I'm glad to be standing before you once again. And uh, before I start, I believe the presence of God is here this morning. Um, he's already moving amongst us. So um, let us be here in attitude of prayer. If you are crying out to God for a need in your life or just asking for asking questions, um, I ask that you um, reach out to him this morning. His spirit is here willing to deal with our hearts and to move in our presence. So let us pray that he will continue to be here uh, and minister to us. Um, I'm going to jump right into it. Um, if you'll go to the next slide, I'm going to continue in our series about looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. And uh, we've been going through... Uh, if you look at this timeline chart we, uh, or the outline of the series, we're still in that first section uh, and we're talking through uh, various forerunners of Christ, people who are shadows of Christ uh, in the Old Testament. And uh, we already covered Abel, we talked about Noah, and then lastly Minu talked about Abraham. Um, today I am going to talk to you about Joseph um, and how... His life reflects uh, Christ uh, and what his work here on earth. Bef but before I talk about Joseph, I just wanted to, and by the way, this is a vast topic, so I'm going to be trying to stay on time and uh, rush through things, so hope you'll keep up with me. Um, but I, before I jump into Joseph, I just feel like I should bridge the gap from Abraham to Joseph a little bit. So if you go to the next slide... Um, one thing that is evident <clears throat> through, as you see in uh, the Old Testament, and you see specific characters and personalities that is highlighted, is, and you just step back and look at it, um, uh, you know, it's like sometimes you see a picture and everything is blurry, and then just a few things are in focus. Have you seen that, the pictures? Jasmine knows, he's nodding his head. Um, so... Uh, I don't know what that is called, but either way, you're, you can, so when you step back from Scripture and you can see that certain personalities are highlighted, and one specific, you can draw a straight line from, and if you study the genealogy of Christ, and you can see uh, from the promise that was given in the garden at the beginning that the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. Right? That was a promise that was given. From that time, through the descendants from Adam on, um, and already talked about some of this when I talked about Noah, right? Um, from then to Abraham, um, and then uh, Isaac, and Jacob, and then the 12 sons of Jacob. And you can see that God gave great care to ensuring that the seed of the woman is preserved, right? Meaning that the Christ, the one who is to come, will come and will be in a certain genealogy already planned by God, right? That was God's selection. That's why he selected Isaac over Ishmael. That was the son of promise. He was the one who was to receive all the inheritance from Abraham, even though Abraham had several children, actually, um, over his life. Um, and then Jacob was chosen before Esau, right? It says later in the New Testament, before they knew right or wrong, God selected Jacob. He said, Jacob have I loved, and Esau I have hated. You could say maybe God foresaw that Esau was going to uh, uh, give up his birthright, and maybe that's why, but I believe God selected Jacob you know, beforehand to carry the seed of the woman. So the same way, so I, uh, we, I mean, Jacob himself, his life is a, you could spend a whole sermon on that, but we're, if we have time, maybe we'll come back to it. Right now, my focus today is Joseph, so I'm going to keep going quickly. So Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then Jacob's 12 sons, right? So something interesting there, even though the story of Joseph is the one that is highlighted. You can read Genesis 
37 all the way to Genesis 50, right? And nearly a third of the book, and you'll, uh, a little less than a third of the book, uh, but uh, you can see it's about Joseph. But who did Christ come through? Judah, right? So, and we don't understand the plan of God, right? Judah was meant to be who Christ will come through. And there is a plan for, of God for that. But he selected Judah, but Joseph is the one who saved Israel at that time. And Joseph is the, is the shadow of Christ in that time, not Judah. Okay, Judah many times was not a good example in that form. But David came through Judah, and in that lineage, David was a man after God's own heart. So God selected Judah, but Joseph was the shadow of Christ. Does that make sense? Okay, so the reason I, one reason I said that, sometimes people use this, this concept uh, to uh, twist scripture, and I'm being a little forward when I say this, to talk about predestination and selection in the New Testament concept. I personally don't agree with that, that even though God selected specific people to carry the seed of the woman until the fulfillment of the promise, I believe the door is wide open to anybody now who will receive the grace of Christ. It's not only certain people who have access to this grace. If you give your heart to Christ, his grace is sufficient to save you today. Amen? It is not an exclusive club. It is not just for one or two, uh, just certain people from a certain family. The selection of God applied at that time, it doesn't apply the same way now, meaning the door of salvation is open to anybody who is willing to partake in that. Amen? You all with me? Amen. So, okay, now I'll come back. Oh, one more thing. Uh, I'm going to come back to this uh, at the end, but one thing you see is that from Abraham uh, through Joseph, really, um, there is this cave of Machpelah that Abraham purchased from the Hittites for 400 uh, shekels, and it is near the place called Mamre or Hebron, um, and uh, we weren't ready to go to that slide yet, but, but that's what, uh, the cave of Machpelah. So, so Abraham purchased this. It was near where he was living, and that is the cave that where they buried uh, uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Leah, uh, and not Rachel. Could be a reason because, uh, I don't want to get into why not Rachel, but she died on the way, so she wasn't buried there. And then finally, Joseph desired to be brought back uh, there later. So I'll come back to that. Just remember that, the cave of Machpelah. Okay, now, so I must move quickly. Uh, so, okay, now we come to, if you go to the next slide, journey of Joseph is, the, is my topic for today. <clears throat> um, I want to read Hebrews chapter 11, verse 22. By faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. So I, I'm assuming that all of us, or at least most of us, are familiar with the actual story of Joseph. And like I said, it spans from Genesis chapter 37 through Genesis chapter 50. And he's referenced in the Psalms and other places, and then here in Hebrew. Um, so if you want to familiarize yourself with the story of Joseph, I encourage you to go back and read it carefully. So I am going to actually uh, use pastor's example and give you seven points uh, from the story of Joseph and not rehash all of the story about Joseph. I feel like we know his story very well. You all okay with that? Okay, all right, so I want to tell you seven themes that I see from the story of Joseph, um, if you'll bear with me. First point is, and if you'd like to take notes, uh, I'll re uh, reiterate each of the points, but if you want to take this down, the first thing we learn about the story of Joseph is one of Christian maturity. Christian maturity. 
this is a part of the journey of Joseph. We understand that when you, one of the first things said about Joseph is that what? He was loved by his father, which is a good thing, but he used to bring e an evil report about his brothers all the time, right? And that's how he started, and his brothers just hated him. Um, which, yes, if somebody is you know, doing something wrong, you should hold them accountable. But I would say he had to mature in that aspect of his life because maybe that's not how he should have conducted himself, right? So he was not there yet. It was fine that his father loved him, and he gave him a multicolored coat, but he had to reach that level of Christian maturity over his journey. And we can see that at the end of the story where, where even though his brother sold him into slavery, even though all the things that he endured is because of the actions of his brother and not because of anything he did, right? Their hatred towards him. But you can see at the end, he was willing to forgive his brothers. Not only that, he understood all the things that he went through was just so that he was a tool, so he could be a tool used by God to save not only his brothers and his family, all of Israel, but also the whole world at that time. So it takes a level of maturity to reach that place where you're not holding a grudge, right? And God is asking us to also reach that level of maturity where we can let things go. Stop holding on to grudges because of people did something to you. In the church or in your family or your workplace, don't hold on to grudges. Maybe God used that as an opportunity to mold you into the image of Christ, to build in you the fruit, or maybe to use you for a greater purpose, right? So we all should strive to reach that level of maturity just like Joseph. The second thing, second point, the so first was Christian maturity. Second one is choice versus circumstance. Choice versus circumstance. So one thing you see through the story of Joseph is that a lot of things that happened to him were outside of his control, right? It was circumstantial, like his brothers doing that to him. That was a circumstance. He did not do that on his own. He was sold... Uh, put in a pit, sold into slavery. From the slavery, uh, uh, he went into a prison. From the prison, you know, he was raised up to be the right hand of Pharaoh. All of those things were circumstances that were beyond your control. In our life, there are things that happen to you be that are beyond your control that just happened because it was the, either the plan of God or the turn of events that you were impacted by. Amen? How you react to that, how you live through that, how you respond in those situations, whether it's a good circumstance or a bad circumstance, is what determines your character in Christ. So are you still willing to be like Joseph, be faithful in wherever he was? It says that he was faithful in everything, no matter if he was a slave or in the prison. He found favor because of his attitude and his character. Amen? Are you willing to be the same person regardless of the circumstance that comes about your life? And not resort to uh, blaming or name-calling or just being weighted, weighted down by negative attitude but realizing that, you know what? I'm a child of God. Nothing happens without the plan of God. I'm going to choose to have a good attitude. I'm going to choose to be patient. I am going to choose to Christ rather than being weighed down my circumstances. But the second side of it, you can see the, from the story of Joseph, is choice. There are certain things he had to choose to do that directed the course of his life. He had to choose to run away from temptation. He had to choose that he was not going to give in to the enticement of Potiphar's wife. He had to choose, like I said, to be faithful in what he did in, in prison and in other places. He had to choose that he was going to be bold enough to bring forth his gifts that God has given of dreams and visions. He could have been just like, 
you know what, I, I don't like what's happening to me, I'm just gonna just not do this dreams and visions thing. Look at how it worked out for me. I had these two dreams and it, it didn't really work out to me. I got hated and now look where I am. No, he was faithful to the gifts he was given. He, that was a choice, amen? And those choices ultimately ended up leading him to where he was towards the end of his life. So don't be a victim of your circumstance, but also make the right choices when you're confronted with choices. Amen? So that's the third, second thing. Third thing, I've got to go faster. <clears throat> Vision versus fulfillment. Vision versus fulfillment. It could be a long time. It was about, he was about 17 years old when he was sold into slavery. And it was another 13 years before that came to pass, where he was on the right hand of Pharaoh. So the vision, as it says in Habakkuk, what? The vision was set for an appointed time. It will happen. It will not tarry. It will happen at the appointed time. If you believe that God has given you a promise or answered your prayer and you believe in the plan of God, sometimes you might just have to wait. There's nothing else to do but wait, right? And be faithful in the waiting. But understand that God, the one who promised you, is able to bring it to pass. No matter the circumstance, no matter what happens along the way, no matter what is before your eyes or what is happening around you or around the world, if he has made you a promise or confirmed your prayer, he will bring it to pass. Amen? Amen? So vision versus fulfillment. Number four, <clears throat> everyone's not your friend. That's the one thing you see throughout Joseph's life. Everybody is not your friend. Amen? His brothers... Well, even his father got angry at him because he saw a dream that implied that his father was going to bow down at him, right? Uh, we might not have people who are our best, well, best wishers in every stage of our life. And we have to be okay with that. Some people might be self-seeking. Uh, for example, uh, uh, the, the butler, um, he was let go from prison because of what Joseph, well, Joseph predicted that will happen, right? And, but he later forgot about Joseph. He was not a friend of Joseph. It just shows that we cannot fully put our trust in man. We cannot fully put our trust in the things that we see. But our trust, we can fully put in our God. Amen? So everyone's not your friend means that we have to be patient with people. If somebody does not treat you well, be patient with them. Maybe there's something going on in their life that you don't know about, right? Maybe they're bitter because the same things that happened to Joseph happened to them and that's just how they're acting out. Maybe the love and compassion that you show them will lead them to a change in their own lives. So even if they're not your friend, today, they might be someday. So be patient with people. That was number four. Number five, God's, I already touched on this, but it's a specific thing that you see in the story of Joseph. God's plan is immutable. It's unchanging. God, the plan of God will come to pass. No power in this world, no principality, no human being can stand in the path of the plan of God. That is one thing that you see. If you don't see anything else, that is the one thing that you see from, like I said, from the vision to the fulfillment. You can see that God's plan was fulfilled. In fact, the reason that the butler forgot about Joseph, I believe, so that it was another two years when he remembered him, so that it was at the right time he will remember him when the Pharaoh had the dream. Because the famine, at the time of plenty and the time of famine was just about to start. If he had remembered him right when he got out of prison, maybe all these things wouldn't have happened. He would have said, okay, nice. Maybe he would have gotten out of prison or not, right? But at the right time, according to the plan of God, he was freed and then became the second in command. Or later, 
<clears throat> when, um, uh, when Joseph meets his brothers later and he tells them, brothers, don't worry. All these things happened for your blessing. Even after Jacob died, the brothers were afraid that uh, Joseph was now going to treat them bad to, re uh, have, to revenge, have revenge on his brothers. He said, no. All these things happened for your blessing. It said, in fact, for the, uh, there's a specific verse, he says, for the giving of life is why these things happen to me. For, so that life can be preserved. Amen? So, connecting everything, I mean, that takes a certain amount of Christian maturity to realize that. But also understanding the plan of God in your life. Where does your life fit into the plan of God? Have you staying on track of what God's call is for your life? That's something we have to constantly evaluate. Am I in the plan of God or am I walking away from it? And we have to constantly evaluate that. Uh, number six, I already talked about this. Be faithful to your gift. Be faithful to your gift no matter the circumstance. Be true to what God has entrusted you with. He gave you a gift of whatever it might be. Right here in Joseph's case, it was dreams and interpretation of dreams. God gave, entrusted that with, with him, and he was faithful no matter the circumstance. So understand the call of God in your life and the, dream, uh, the, uh, the gifts that he has given you faithfully and be faithful to that. And stop giving excuses of the things that are happening in your life. He will give you the strength and the ability to be faithful to that. So be faithful to your gift. Lastly, number seven, in the world, but not of the world. In the world, but not of the world. Joseph knew who he was. You know, when his brother saw him towards the last part of the story, they didn't even recognize him. He was speaking Egyptian. He was wearing all this makeup probably like you see in the cartoons. Uh, and all the Egyptian garb, I think they shaved his head and everything. And he was unrecognizable. He was in the world, in that culture, in that society. But he knew who he was, why he was there. He was not of Egyptians. He, when he wanted to be buried, uh, he wanted to, his legacy to be countered with Israel. He was not off. He didn't want to be known, uh, you know, maybe they, they might have built a pyramid for him because of what he did for that country. He saved that country. He didn't want a pyramid. He didn't want a legacy in this world, but he wanted to be known that he is part of the patriarchs. He's part of his father's house. He is one of Israel, and he wanted to be counted among them. He was in the world, but not of the world. We can create a bubble for ourselves and escape it. We live in this world. We have successes and failures in this world. We might climb to the top of a, a you know, Fortune 500 company. Or we might be great, a great entrepreneur who builds the next Google or uh, Tesla or whatever it is. But the question is, are those things what define you? Or is it your identity in Christ that defines you? So that means whether you fail or succeed in this world, it doesn't matter. I am of the kingdom of Christ, not of this world and its kingdom. Amen? So those are the seven points uh, that I learned from this journey of Joseph. Um, so I'm going to move forward real quick. My time's um, I'm pretty much up. So I'm going to go quickly to the next part, which is the next slide, please. Just draw a quick comparison to Joseph and Christ. Why is he a shadow or a forerunner of Christ? There's so many. I mean, there's so many. I didn't even capture all of it. You can talk about the dreams that Joseph had and his ability. I draw a parallel between that and the nearly three to 500 mess messianic prophecies about Jesus that were fulfilled. You can see the connection between the dreams that Joseph had that were fulfilled much, many years later and the, uh, the prophecies about Christ. I can see a parallel between the multicolored coat that jo Joseph was given and the promise that uh, the Christ was given, ask of me and I will give you the nations. 
To me, the multicolored uh, colors represent all of us, the Gentiles, that were brought into the kingdom of God. And that was a promise from the father, just like Joseph was given that coat by his father. I can see the, the, all the things that happened to Joseph, maybe not in the right sequence, but a lot of those aspects, Jesus went through himself. He was sold, we all know this one, sold for 20 shekels, where Joseph was sold for 30. He was, uh, went through trials just like um, he was rejected and was tried just like Jesus was rejected. He, in fact, it was Judah, his forefather in the human sense, who said, sell him to the Ishmaelites. Maybe if he was left in the pit, Reuben would have come back and saved him. But Judah betrayed him and said, sell him to the Ishmaelites. I can see that parallel, that when he was in prison, uh, <clears throat> in prison, it was like when he was in the grave and he was, uh, after he died on the cross, and he came out of the prison, just like Jesus resurrected from the dead. And the, I can see from there, Jesus rose up to be sitting on the right hand of the Father, just like Joseph sat on the right hand of the Pharaoh. And when they went in the streets, uh, Joseph had a second chariot and everybody was told to bow the knee. Just like it says, every knee shall bow to Christ and every tongue will confess to Christ. And I can see that he is the great interceder for us. He is the great high priest, just like Joseph was. He interceded for Israel. He said, this is my people. Let them come live safely in Egypt. He interceded and saved his people, just like Jesus is on the right hand of the Father today, interceding for us. And I can see, finally, he was the author and the finisher of our faith, just like our keepers. Joseph gave the interpretation of the dream. And Pharaoh said, you have the wisdom to fulfill it. Amen? So Jesus, was he wrote our faith, our word, and he finished it through his death. That's why he's the author and the finisher of our faith. You can see why Joseph, not Judah, was the forerunner of Christ for that time and the shadow of Christ. Amen? <clears throat> and finally, I will come back to Joseph, the first verse we read. If you'll go to the next slide. And the cave of Machpelah, which is known as the cave of the patriarchs. I already touched on this, I just want to summarize. I invite the worship team to come forward. The one thing that stands out, so, okay, coming back to the cave of the patriarchs. And I said, Abraham bought this cave and it was near Hebron, right? Um, and it was where all of the patriarchs were buried. The, the, what does Hebron mean? Fellowship, right? It is a company of saints it is a gathering of the assembly of the saints that, just like it says in Hebrews chapter um, 10, that we've come to the assembling together of the saints, an innumerable company, right? That is Hebron. But we know it says in Hebrews chapter 13 that the, um, I'm going to read that real quick. <clears throat> uh, verse 11 for the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burnt without the cry, uh, without, outside the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate or outside the gate. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. Amen. I believe the cave represents a cross. In fact, many believe that Golgotha was right on top of the actual cave. I don't know if that's true. Um, I believe this is showing just like Christ died outside the camp to bear the reproach. The forefathers were simply bearing a shadow of the cross. That they, were, they died in the cross. And they all gathered together in one place. So when Joseph said, I want to be buried here, he was simply saying, don't bury me here in Egypt. I want to be dead in the cross, outside the camp, outside so that my fellowship eventually is in Mamre or Hebron. I belong in Hebron. I belong in that company of saints. And I want to be buried 
or died and remembered at the cross. This is what the cave of Machpelah represents. This is why Joseph is in the hall of faith, is because of what he wanted. He believed that one day he will be back there, that the, no matter what that time is, that he believed that he will be taken back there and joined in the cross. So, so let me ask you this one more time, is that no matter what position you are in, you might be very successful in this world or you might not be, is your desire to have, leave a, a legacy here, to be known and famous here, or is your desire to be hidden in the cross with the many company of saints before us? Are we desiring for our bones to be joined in the cross of Christ Hallelujah. outside the camp, bearing the reproach that brings with it, so we may enjoy the fellowship with the saints? Or are we wanting a legacy here? That's the question we have to ask ourselves and, and decide for ourselves, what do we want in this life? What are we seeking after? On the outside, we look like Egyptians, like everybody else. But in the inside, what does the beating of your heart say? I desire to go back to Hebron. I desire to be part of that fellowship. May his name be glorified. <laughs>